Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I am here today with a special guest on my channel who needs no introduction, Dr. Philip McKee, who uh, is now retired and living in uh, Bousset, France. Yeah. And before that was a professor of pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital of the Harvard system. And he was also worked at the Dermatology Institute of London, um, among other places. Uh, he of course is the author of McKee's textbook, uh, the McKee Dermato Dermatopathology textbook, um, Pathology of the Skin with Clinical Correlation. Yeah. Um, and now is uh, most recently the founder of the McKee Derm Facebook group, which has been a phenomenal, amazing success. And really is how I got to know Dr. McKee through social media. And this is now um, the first time we're getting to meet in real life here at the McKee Derm Conference in Kiev. So thank you for taking time to meet with me. And mine. thank you. It's uh, been an amazing meeting and a really, really wonderful time. Uh, I wanted to just ask you a couple of uh, questions. The first one is, how did you become a dermatopathologist? Well, I, I could go a little bit further back than that. When I was a youngster, my, my ambition was to be a fighter pilot. That's what I really wanted to do. And I, I came from a very Victorian household. And uh, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents had all been in medicine. So when I was 14, I was told, no, you can't be a fighter pilot, you're going to be a doctor. <coughs> so that was the end of that. So I went into medical training and I started when I was 17 years and two months. I was very young. And I qualified in uh, 1972. And I, the thing I realized more than anything else was I didn't like patients. I never wanted to actually have to talk to people. So I thought pathology would be the best thing to do. Uh, little did I know that with the passage of time I'd end up having to talk to patients again <laughs> and then I discovered I actually liked it. But the, the issue, the question was how did I get into dermatopathology and that, that's actually, it was very ser serendipitous. I, I had no particular interest in dermpath uh, to begin with, it was just another of the subjects that I had to think about when I was training. and. Uh, it just happened that one day in the pathology department I was walking along the corridor and in the distance there was a professor of pathology who was a lovely lady and uh, the chief of the dermatology service and they were having a very animated conversation and uh, I didn't really catch up what was going on but I innocently was walking ahead and suddenly the professor of pathology said Philip would you come over here so I went over to her and she said uh, to Dr. Baer, who was the dermatologist, well, you've actually got a dermatopathologist. This is him. This is he. And I looked at her and I thought, well, God, what do I say now? And doc, doc, Dr. Baer said, well, it's very nice to meet you, Philip. I'm going to enjoy working with you. So with one year and one month of pathology, I suddenly discovered I was the dermatopathologist, <laughs> which was a very unnerving state of affairs. So I grabbed myself my, my uh, uh, I think it was the fourth or, or fifth edition of Lever, and the other book that was available at that time was uh, Helwig's textbook on dermal pathology. So I got those two books, and uh, then I started making it up as I went along. <laughs> so you were assigned dermatopathology, but it's, it's worked out pretty well for you, I think. It absolutely, it actually, it couldn't have been better. Uh, I suddenly, well, I, I tell you the thing is, I realized, now, I didn't like autopsies. I didn't like cytology. I didn't even like surgical pathology, to be honest with you. I, I discovered I did like d dermatopathology. In fact, I became, I fell in love with it. I, it was such a wonderful subject because you had the patients. Uh, I suddenly realized I do like patients. You could talk to them and you could poke them and prod them and look at them. And then you could look down the microscope and you, you had the best of both worlds. And so I realized I needed to learn dermatology. And it, for anybody who's thinking of following in my footsteps, uh, in America it's very defined. If you do dermatopathology you've got to do your fellowship uh, involving dermatology but for the rest of the world this isn't the case. But if you actually want to be any good at dermpath you've got to be a good dermatologist or you've got to good, have a good understanding of it. But you'll find that it's actually such a pleasure 
to look at patients and correlate the two things I together. I completely agree. It's been the most wonderful thing to, to get to do this as my job. I come to work and I have fun and I help patients and I get paid for doing that. It's, yeah. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. So, so tell, me, tell me about your textbook. How did you decide to write a dermatopathology textbook? How did that all come about? Well, it, again, that was one of these, uh, another serendipitous moment. I, at that time, well, I began my career in London after my fellowship at St. John's. I then did a fellowship at King's College Hospital. And I got very friendly with the dermatologist there. It was a lovely man called Anthony Duvivier. And he was writing a beautiful atlas of, uh, dermato of clinical dermatology. It is beautiful. It's a nice yeah, book. It's a great book. And he wanted someone to do the pathology. So he asked me, would I do it? So I said, sure, that's no problem. So I started working with him. And he, his book was published by a very small private company called Gawa Medical Publications, which was a private company, a small company, and a, it was a lovely place to work. And uh, Anthony de Vivier mentioned my name to the, to the owners of Gawa Medical Publishing, and mm -hmm. somehow or other persuaded them that they wanted me to write them a book of Dermpath. So uh, I said, again, I said, sure thing. That's not a problem. Now, that was very early on in my career, so I suppose I had no right to write a book on dermatopathology, <laughs> really, but nothing, nothing sort of stops me when I get a mind to it. <laughs> so I didn't really mind too much. Uh, and I just said about writing a book that I actually enjoyed. It was, it w it was, it, it was really done for fun. Uh, and I enjoyed every moment of it. Wrote a textbook for fun. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now that was volume one, uh, the the first edition. Then it all went downhill <laughs> because uh, one of my friends, uh, the late uh, Professor Edward Wilson Jones from St John's Hospital, he came to see me and he said, "That's a great book, Philip, but uh, don't you think you ought to have had a reference or two? <laughs> so I said, "Yes, I suppose I should have done." So I uh, okay. Okay, Edward, uh, the next edition we'll put references in. And that, that, of course, changed it. It changed it all. Because suddenly I started having to do work <laughs> rather than just have fun. <laughs> and with each progressive edition, we got to the third edition, which then became very large. And it started, I started losing control of it. And I had two problems. One is I wanted three volumes. Which, the, which Elsevier refused to do. They said, there's no way you're having a three volume book. And I said, but it would be so cool. <laughs> I'd be the only person in the world with three volume textbook. And they said, well, that's too bad. <laughs> too you're bad. having two volumes. And then because of the workload, I took on Eduardo Colange. Now, Eduardo is, is a great one. Well, I'm, he's a sort of a, I'm a father figure to Eduardo. When he came to the UK from Colombia, uh, he came to St. Thomas's and I was his mentor, uh, and uh, we became very, very close friends. And Eduardo became this wonderful being that he is, with a, an encyclopedic knowledge of all things, not just dermatopathology. I hasten to add. So I thought he'd be the ideal guy to take on to help me. So Eduardo helped me with the third edition. Then we fast forward to Boston and Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I had the time of my life, the experience of which I, I, I treasure forever. But the workload then became, it just was totally impossible. So then I took on uh, Scott Granter and uh, Alex Lazar and Thomas Bren, and they then contributed to the book. But we tried, my, my job then was to try to rewrite everyone else's chapter so that the style stayed the same. And I, I, I was responsible always for all the histopathology photography. And then I decided enough's enough. Uh, I, I don't want anything more to do with this book. Eduardo, would you take it on? And I'm so grateful that he did it. And when I got my copy of the fifth edition, I thought, wow, this is just gorgeous. It is beautiful. Gorgeous. I actually beautiful um, plan to have a review of that book up online on my YouTube channel, hopefully pretty soon. So uh, uh, if you're watching this, uh, check down on the links below, and I'll put a link down there once it's live. Um, you mentioned today during the conference, or yesterday maybe, that you wrote 
by hand with a fountain pen the entire text of your book, 900,000 words or something? Yeah, Tell me that again, because I still just can't fathom well, how. I, I, I have a, I think, as I mentioned, I think all, all pathologists, well, perhaps all doctors are obsessive and compulsive. I am very obsessive compulsive, and I had this thing, I didn't want to use a computer, and I had a secretary, she was a private secretary that worked for me uh, on consultations and papers and things, and so I cut a deal with her that I would pay her to type the manuscript. And uh, she, the problem I had was that I didn't want her to see any imperfection in, in me. <laughs> And so, and I had, I'd been given this beautiful Mont Blanc pen, which was l really lovely, and I had the special ink that you get with the pen so that you don't do any damage, and I thought, well, I'll just write it. So I, I wrote the entire second edition, which, if you add the references, equals 970,000 words. But, now here's the reality of it all. I was... I was writing on nice unlined A4 paper, and when I started at the top left and went to the top right, it had to be absolutely parallel with the edge of the paper, and each line below had to be absolutely parallel. And I found from time to time that my handwriting sloped down a bit, and when that happened, I, I had to rewrite the whole thing again, <sighs> uh, which became a bit of a problem. And if I cross something out, then I had to rewrite that page. So although it was 970,000 words, I have a feeling it probably was nearer, maybe one and a quarter million words, if you are add for the pages that I had to dispose of. That was the second edition. I then learned that uh, I wasn't going to do this ever again. My, my heart is like palpitations uh, just hearing you tell that story that I can't fathom that amount of work. I just wrote a small book and it took me forever and I had a computer to use. So um, that's amazing. Um, you retired, what year did you retire from Harvard, from Brigham and Women's? Gosh, nine, oh, 2004. And then you moved to France and then... No, I moved to Arizona. Oh, to Arizona, that's yeah. right. First to drive Ferraris, right? Because you, you wanted to fly, fighter uh, be a fighter pilot, but your parents said no. So instead you decided to drive Ferraris uh, around Arizona. That sounds like a pretty, pretty fun time. It, it, it was, that was... Well, when I was in Arizona, I didn't... I retired from clinical practice, but I still... Uh, I did consultation work. I did quite a lot, but I couldn't do it for the U.S. because uh, of the requirement to, to issue a bill. And I, I thought of doing that, and then I... So I went to an insurance company and said, how much do I have to pay insurance to do consultation work? And they said $76,000. And I thought, well, God, I'll never earn that in consultation fees, so I'll be, I'll be paying for the privilege of doing consults. So I thought, well, I won't do that. So I set up a, a sort of a sort of organisation, overseas, overseasconsultation.com, and I looked at cases from anywhere in the world other than the states, which was a great shame because. I had so many contacts in the States, but I wasn't allowed to do it. Anyway, what, it did, uh, what did happen to my great benefit was the third edition. Now, I did mention, I didn't write the book to earn money. That was not the object of the exercise, but the third edition did prove to be financially very rewarding. And so I was able to, I worked my way, the trouble with, with cars and speed is you get very used to what you've got and then you want more. <laughs> so I started off with a, a 355 Ferrari, which was about 380 horsepower, and then I went to a 360, which was about 440. Then I bought a fourth, I sold those, bought a 430 and got it modified to a 600 brake horse car, <laughs> and it was, it was phenomenal. And I'm gonna tell you something, because it's, they can't arrest me now. <laughs> so, there was one day, I, I was with two friends and we were racing, and this guy was determined to beat me, and I, I was having none of it. And we're on this bit of straight road, it's a 60 mile per hour limit, and I was doing 184 miles per hour. And I suddenly thought, Jesus, what am I doing? 
But he had backed off long ago, <laughs> and I suddenly realized I was on my own screaming down the road, but I managed to slow down for the next bend, and all was well. But and I thought back, <laughs> if the police had caught me, I'd have been in jail. Still For now. life, yes, we would, we would have missed out on this nice conversation we're getting to have. Um, <laughs> That's, uh, we should go find a place to rent a Ferrari. I want to ride in a Ferrari with you, but maybe not at 184 miles an hour. Well, it's you gotta go, that's the sort of speed you gotta go. You just go gotta, do it. You gotta, you gotta do, do it, you gotta do it. Um, you decided to join Facebook and uh, sometime when you were retired, right? How did you decide to join Facebook or Twitter or social media? And, uh, and then how did that lead to you starting McKee Durham Facebook group? Well, that's, this time, uh, I usually don't discuss this, but for once I just be very personal. I got cancer of the stomach, so I had to have my stomach removed, which was done very nicely and that worked fine. But the problem was I was in a French hospital and everybody around me were French. And I love the French, but I wish they spoke English. It would be <laughs> much easier. It's a lovely language, but I don't understand it. So I got very frustrated because I couldn't understand anybody. They couldn't understand me. And Grace said to me, why don't you look at, fa why don't you join Facebook? And I thought, I want to join Facebook because it's, you know, it's narcissistic and all the things that people say. And then I, I thought, okay, I will join it. So I joined it and I made some friends. And then I, I suddenly got addicted to this ridiculous thing and I was up all night following one post to another reading and I was educating myself and I was it was so exciting and I can tell you it's much better than morphine as a pain control because you get really <laughs> into it and I can't remember there must have been some post that got me in contact with you, I don't know how I got in contact oh, with I you. I actually remember that. I saw that you joined, and I, I think, I think actually your Twitter like had part of your email in it, and I sent you a message to say maybe you should change that. And then I was like, oh, by the way, I'm a huge fan, and I think you're amazing. And so I was like a real fan girl or fan boy, whatever, about the I whole thing. Girl, but it was I yeah, okay. It. But I was I was very excited to actually get a chance to to have direct contact with someone whose book I've been reading since I was in training. And, um, and then I think I told you, oh, you know, if you need help with social media stuff, I can, I, it's kind of my thing, I do that. And then, then we started messaging and staying in touch. So, yes. and it, it's worked out quite nicely, I think. Oh, it's worked out. It's worked out. Oh, it's just fantastic. So then you started the McKee Durham Facebook group, right? Yes. To, and w what was your idea behind, what did you want the group to become? What did you want to do with it? Oh gosh, that's, uh, that, I, I could talk for an hour about that, but very briefly. I wanted to create an environment of kindred spirits that loved the subject and that were from from everywhere in the world. I, I that was the whole I, the whole idea was to bring people from north, south, east, and west together in a, a friendly environment. I think the world was in such a mess. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had a world where we all talked to each other and it didn't matter whether we were a man or a woman, what religion we were, what color we were, we could get rid of all of that and we could just become friends. And I thought, this is, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create that environment. And I think I've succeeded in that. Cause I think so. We, we, I, I think we've got, Adrian might know the answer, but I, I think we've got at least 90% of countries in the world are now, there are people on the, uh, from the group. I think there's so, some countries we maybe haven't got to, but we'll try to and we'll identify who they are or where they are and then we'll send in the team and <laughs> get, them on, get them on board. I think that's, that's amazing. and. Um, Obviously, from all the feedback we hear from everyone around the world, the, the, this group is an incredible resource because not only is it good for teaching, but it also is a way for people to share difficult cases and get an unofficial opinion, usually directly from you, which is the thing that to me has really impressed me is that you 
in your retirement are taking the time to still teach and pass on your wisdom and to actually help people, like you said, without borders, without any other restraint, you can help people help their patients anywhere on earth. And to me, that's so amazing and inspiring. And, um, and I also, as you know, we wrote the paper together um, recently. I'll put a link to that uh, below too about social media use for pathologists of all ages. And the reason that I wanted to write that was I've given lectures and told people for a long time, you should join social media, it's amazing. And people eventually started ignoring me because they said, Jared's just young and has these crazy ideas. And Dr. McKee is a bit older than me. And so when he started using social media and he got famous the old fashioned way by writing books and going to meetings, um, I thought this is this is the person I've been looking for all this time. When people say I'm too old, I can't. I'm like Philip McKee is doing this, and he's retired. You have no excuse. So maybe I'm a little hard on people, but that's just how I am. But I think it's been it's been awesome for me because what an amazing thing that you can take the wisdom of your whole career and share those experiences, not just with the trainees, but with people like me. I've learned so much from watching how you handle difficult cases and and the comments you make and. Uh, talking about things in the past that maybe, you know, like the BAPOMA that you thought was a nevoid melanoma because we didn't know what BAPOMA was yet. And wow, what, what rich wisdom that's there now um, for, for generations. When, when all of us are gone, that stuff will, whatever Facebook will be in that day, it will still be preserved forever because what's on the internet, I guess, is forever. It's forever. Um, I think it's, it's amazing. And you've made such huge contributions to the field of dermatopathology and to patient care throughout your whole career. And now you're continuing to do that every day. And uh, to me, uh, having the chance to have this interview with you and be at this meeting has just been such a, an incredible honor. And thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.